Okay, a uh, short three-day unit for grade 12 college prep physics uh, on heat. So I got a, a fairly lengthy note for you, and then you'll have about three days to just work through um, work through the assignments on it related to heat. <clears throat> so um, heat is it's a, an extension of the energy unit, though it is not mechanical energy. It's, you know, this is fancy words, uh, transferred from one object to another by thermal interaction. It's you know, touching something and it makes you hot. <laughs> it burns you, okay? That's heat. Uh, one thing you may or may not remember, I'm going to show you this little video here, if I can get it to play. The music's a bit silly, but... theory is the theory that all matter is composed of atoms and molecules that are in constant motion. The particles move at random and hold kinetic energy. The more energy a particle has, the more and faster it will move. In solids, such as ice, the molecules hardly move at all and hold a regular pattern because the energy is low and the molecules are tightly packed. In a liquid, like water, the molecules have freedom to move around and have more energy. Liquids have the ability to fill any shape of any container they are put in. In gases like steam, the molecules have the most energy. Gases can expand and compress to fill any container. All matter contains atoms and molecules that are moving. The warmer the temperature, the more energy these particles have. And that is the kinetic molecular theory. Alright, so that was to be a review from grade 9 science actually, that you know hot particles move faster than... than than uh, cold particles, and that's what makes them um, that makes them have more energy, kind of like kinetic energy. The faster something moves, the more energy it has. Um, so just some, um, you know, an important thing to distinguish is the difference between heat and temperature. Heat is actually energy; it's a form of energy, uh, and it has a symbol E. <coughs> excuse me, um, with the subscript H for heat. I guess it's pretty easy, and it's measured in joules, just like all other energies. Uh, temperature, though, is just a describing word. So where heat is, a, is like a noun, a temperature is a uh, adjective. It describes something. We give it the symbol T for temperature, and we measure it in two different ways. Celsius, which we're used to. You've probably also heard Fahrenheit before, but we don't use Fahrenheit in this class. We do use Kelvin. And let me explain what Kelvin is. Um, Kelvin is a temperature scale. That's It's the same size as degrees Celsius, but it's just designed so there's no negative numbers. So it takes what the absolute coldest something can be, and that absolute coldest would be minus 273 uh, Celsius, and we call that absolute zero. So that's as cold as something can be, and we call that zero. So instead, you never have a negative number then. There's no such thing as a negative Kelvin. It, it has not been found, I, I think, scientists to see it as, a, as an impossibility. There's not many things they consider impossible, but below zero degrees Kelvin is one. The reason, of course, is that, uh, you know, if we think about things, you know, the different, the different substances, uh, they, uh, it's, it depends on how, ma how much the, the particles move. Well, if you, have a part of, if you have a substance with absolutely no motion at all, that would be minus 273 Celsius or zero degrees Kelvin. You can't have less than no motion, right? And that's why. As far as I think anybody knows right now, there's no such thing as anything lower than minus 273 Celsius. Uh, that's what I'm saying. All motion and all particles. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, in labs, they actually have gotten like 0 0.0000001 degree Celsius, or degree Kelvin, but they've never, they don't expect to get lower than that. Uh, so there is something, though, this weird type of matter. And you know, we... Uh, we talk about solid, liquid, and gas. Of course, those are the common states of matter. Plasma, you see plasma in my classroom almost every day. You know my little ball up on the filing cabinet? That's a plasma ball, right? So, And that is a state of matter, and it means that what it is, is it's, uh, it's in this case, it's a gas. It doesn't have to be a gas, but in my, in my plasma ball, it's a gas, where the electricity strips off the electrons. and that, So it's really just the, uh, the nucleus of the gas, and that's called, that's called plasma. Um, then at the other end, there is something that um, Albert Einstein actually proposed with uh, with another scientist. The existence of again never saw it, um, but they thought if a, if a if a, a substance became close to um, absolute zero, it would be it would have its um, 
it would have different properties and would not be a solid anymore, it would be something else, and they call it the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and what is it? Well, it's a big clump of atoms, and they're just so cold, and they clump together, and they, they don't have independent properties anymore. Okay, I have a little video. It would not be a solid, or liquid, or gas. It was given a name almost as strange as its properties, a Bose-Einstein condensate. For the next 70 years, people could only dream about making such a condensate. Matter can exist in various states. Atoms at high temperature always form gases. If you cool the gas, it becomes a liquid. If you cool the liquid, it becomes a solid. But under certain circumstances, if you cool atoms far enough to extremely low temperatures, they undergo a very strange transformation. They undergo an identity crisis. So let me show you what I mean by an identity crisis. When you go to low temperatures, the quantum mechanical properties of the atoms become important. These are very strange, very unfamiliar to us. But in fact, each one of these atoms starts to display wave-like properties. So instead of points like that, you have little wave packets like that moving around. It's really difficult for me to explain just why that is, but that's the way it is. Now, as you go to very low temperatures, the size of these packets gets longer and longer and longer. And then suddenly, if you get them cold enough, they start overlapping. And when they overlap, the system behaves not like individual particles, but particles which have lost their identity. They all think they're everywhere. This little wave packet over here can't tell it whether it's this one or that one or that one or that one, or that one, or it's that there, one. it's there, and it's there. They're all in one great big quantum state. They're all overlapping. They're all doing the same thing. And what they're doing to a good approximation is they're simply sitting at rest. This Bose-Einstein condensate is very difficult to imagine or to visualize. I can imagine what it's like to be an atom running around gaily, freely bouncing into things, sometimes going fast, sometimes going slow. But on the Bose condensate, I'm everywhere at once. I've lost my identity. I don't know who I am anymore. I'm at rest, and all the other atoms around at rest, but they're not other atoms around. We're all just one great big quantum system. There's nothing else like that in physics, and certainly not in human experience. So just to think about this causes me wonder and confusion. Cool that Einstein predicted all that way before, and such a weird thing like that, way before it ever existed, but I think it does. I don't know if any of you are Star Trek fans, but if you do, then they're kind of like the board. But if you don't know what I mean, that's okay. <laughs> um, quickly, though, just about that, that, I'll never test you on that. That's more interest. To me, it's interesting. Um, okay, practical stuff, heat transfer. Uh, this is where we get into the math. Energy can be transformed from one form to another. Uh, in the case of heat, we actually take things from one, one object to another. And we send heat. We never send cold, by the way. Cold doesn't move. Cold is nothing. Cold is cold is the absence of heat. Okay? Cold is not a thing. Heat is a thing. Okay? And we do transfer heat from one object to another. Um, three ways that we do it. Conduction, touching. Convection, that's like cold or warm, warm air currents, right? Um, like out of your furnace duct at home. And radiation is like your, your heating element. Uh, if you put a, you know, a red-hot heating element, put your hand above it. It gets warm because of radiation, or just looking at the sunshine, right? The sunshine hitting your face, that's radiation. Uh, again, conduction is just transferring heat uh, by touching. Things always go heat transfer from warm to cold, always. And some materials can transfer heat better than others, and you know that. That's why some things are insulators and some things aren't. Um, there's actually a property which is called thermal conductivity, and that property tells us how well a substance uh, passes heat, okay? And in general, metals pass heat better than nonmetals. For example, plastic or wood, something like that. And so you can get a number that tells you how well an object conducts heat. So K for a metal would be bigger than K for a plastic. And if I just went onto the internet here, I could... Um, there's a list of thermal conductivities. It has a weird unit. We don't really care. We don't do much with it just to get the idea, looking at some common... Uh, 
Copper, see copper is uh, 401, it's a very high number because copper is a great um, conductor of heat compared to coal, very small, or clay, right? Compare that, how well heat, or sorry, copper transfers heat. And that's what this K value tells you. It just tells you how well so, so something. And you can look that up if ever you're wondering. You know, see insulation, really fiberglass, like really, really low numbers, right? But a metal, or like I say, copper was the greatest by far that I've seen. But iron, for example, even iron though, compared to copper, copper's 480, uh, iron is 80, right? Uh, anyway, so those that's that's thermal conductivity. Um, that's related to contact. Uh, then there's convection, and convection is water, air, or water currents, and that's like or a cool breeze. Well, cool breeze comes and takes the heat off of you, but a warm breeze comes and warms you up. Or you know your furnace is the great example of convection. And then there's radiation, and again, you know sunlight. Or anytime, anytime you see something glowing hot and you come put your hand near it, you're feeling radiation, right? Um, so we can calculate heat. Uh, heat is mass times this C, and I'll talk about C in a minute. C is a constant, um, times the difference in two temperatures, how much it changes. So let me show you an example. Well, I think I'll talk about C first. So this little C. It's another uh, constant for every substance that exists. And it tells you how much energy you need to change the temperature of one kilogram of that substance by one degree Celsius. So, I mean, again, I could look up a table on the internet here. I'm just Googling a table. So this has a specific heat capacity table. And what this tells me, um, these are more uncommon, but say I take water. Water has a number of four. That means it takes four... Um, joules to warm up one, in this case, gram, by one Celsius. If I look down at um, glass, it takes 0 0.84. Or a common thing might be sand. See sand, 0 0.29. Never thought about when you're on the beach. You go to the beach, and it's a hot day, and the sand is burning hot on your toes, right? But you step in the water, and the water is nice and cool. Why is that? You know, we just take it for granted that it's true. But the reason is, it's interesting, the reason is that that same sunlight that's hitting the water and hitting the sand, the sand changes, needs less energy from the sun to change its temperature. Whereas water needs significantly more. And that's why it takes more energy to warm the water. Or the other, the other end of that is cooling water would be the same. At nighttime, you know, the air feels nice and cool and your pool feel, still feels warm. The reason is... You know, it takes a lot, a lot of energy to change the temperature of water compared to air. They're on this list, by the way. Yeah, there, 1.02. So even air, though, compared to sand. sand. Sand doesn't take anything. That's why the air feels hot, but the sand feels burning, right? Um, coming back, though. So that's, that's this. The units of C are confusing. I mean, they're not. They're joules. The amount of energy per kilo to change one kilogram, one degree Celsius. But, you know, you don't need to worry about the units very much. I'll show you what you need to worry about is um, understanding what. So if something has a big heat capacity, that means that a wooden spoon would take more, like if, if, if wood has a bigger C than metal, it means that if you had a wooden spoon and a metal spoon, the wooden spoon would change temperature more slowly than the metal spoon, just like the sand changes more quickly than the water. So just a quick calculation. If you knew a specific heat capacity, uh, a C, was 460, and we want to know how much energy you need to, to change that mass of that material, um, 40 degrees. So you had delta T, change in temperature, is 40 degrees. There's the C, there's the mass, you just multiply it out. And that's how much energy you need to change 2 kilograms of iron at temperature of 40 degrees. Um, so something you can say is that if you have an insulated system, so there's no heat loss to the environment, um, and you have two different substances of different temperatures, you can you can figure out how much heat you need to change the temperature, how much or mass. So for example, if we know if we want to cool an overheated pump, when I worked at 3M, this was sort of something I, I was involved with quite a bit, and I took we wouldn't do it like this of course, but this is a simplified version. Um, you take it and you place it in a cool water tub. And the pump, in the process of cooling down, loses whoopsie, 200,000 joules of energy. 
Well, that means that the water gains 200,000 joules of energy, assuming those are um, heat loss to the environment. And then we can do a more practical formula, right, using the formula for MC and change in temperature. And one refers to something that was originally cooler, and two is something that's originally warmer. And now we have a 5 kilogram pump. We're cooling it from 90 to 10, so changing its temperature 80 degrees. And we're putting it in a cool water bath that's at 4. What, how much water do I need? So the water's coming out of the, of the tap at 4 degrees Celsius. How much of it do I need in order to, to change this temperature? Well, the end game is that the water's going to end up at 10 degrees as well, right? It's not going to get warmer than that. So um, I want them to both end up at 10 degrees. So I have to solve for the mass of the water. And this is a pretty big process. You'll have to do it a couple times for me. This is a big, ugly calculation, but it comes down to this. Okay? Um, you substitute in the C for the pump, the mass of the pump, the change in temperature on the pump. Notice this is negative, and this, this is negative up here, so that the negatives cancel. If you ever get a negative mass, just change it to positive. You probably just messed up somewhere in there. C for water is 4,200, and that's how much the water changes. So if I want to actually stick my 5 kilogram pump in a, in a tub of water to change its temperature to 10 degrees, I need 7.3 kilograms of water. That's what it's saying. So that's a tough calculation. That is the hardest one of the unit, though. And, uh, you know, there's no test, so you just have to be able to do this on your assignment. And that's a long video, but it's done.